Good morning. I'm Anna, one of the pastors here at Cokesbury, and we are so glad that you are here worshiping with us today. Would you all give the students a round of applause for serving with us today? We always love um, having our students involved, but it's special when they get to serve with us. So they're serving at the North Campus today. They'll serve across the street at the South Campus in our traditional service um, next week. So we're thrilled to have them with us as always. Um, We are in a series right now called Making Change. And we do this every fall, usually in the month of October. We spend time talking about what Jesus says about our money. And we talk about how our money relates to our faith. Money is something Jesus talks about a ton in the New Testament, second only to probably talking about the kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven. Talks about those more, but money would be in second place. He talks about it all the time um, because he knows that money has the power to change the world, whether for the good or for the bad. So Jesus says a lot about it. So that's why we take the time to circle back to this topic every single year because money is one of the few things that impacts every single person on the planet. So. Um, that is why we're spending time in this part of scripture. If you have given to Cokesbury Church in the past, I hope that you got this um, piece in the mail here recently. If you didn't get it for some reason, you can let us know in the chat and we'll send you one. You can stop at guest services and they will get that for you. Inside this handout, there's information about this year and about all that God's done so far in 2024. It talks about how we've used the resources that have been given. There is also a pledge card in this handout that you can use to plan your giving for next year. So if you fill out this paper um, pledge, you can put that in the offering basket anytime in one of the boxes on the wall. Or if you're like me and sometimes you can't keep up with paper and you lose it, um, you can go to cokesbury.tv slash give. That's our main give page. And there's a way to do an electronic pledge um, on there as well. So I appreciate um, those of you that have already done that. A lot of you have, and that's just a great way. um, One, for your individual family to think and pray about where God's leading you in your giving, but then also for the church um, to be able to plan as well. But I wanted to take a second as we're getting into our last week of this series, just to say thank you for the incredible generosity of this church. I I mean, I could spend our whole time together today telling you stories about what your generosity and your faithfulness has done in this community and beyond. And I also know that there are so many more stories than even the ones that we know about the impact of what this church family has done. So I just thank you. Whenever we come and say, hey, there's this special need, you guys jump on that immediately. You are so faithful to give. But even maybe the more amazing thing is the just weekly faithful generosity. Those of you that give online or do recurring giving or put something in the basket every week, that faithfulness allows us to keep the lights on and keep the doors open so that we can keep showing up to do what God's asked us to do. So I just can't thank you enough for all the ways that you do that. You all are amazing um, and you inspire me and you allow God to do a lot of incredible things through this church. So thank you for that. Um, This is why We spend so much time talking about this because we know, those of us in this church family, and if you're new, you'll hear about it while you're here, that generosity can change the world. When people like you and like me and this church family are generous together, what we can do together adds up to way more than what we could do by ourselves. So we've been diving in each week to a different principle about money as it relates to our faith. So the first week of this series, we talked about the fact that everything we have belongs to God. So that when we give, we're not actually deciding what to give away, we're deciding what to keep because it's all God's, everything we have in this world. In the second week, we talked about how when we put God first, there's always enough, that God is a God of abundance, that God's always meeting our needs. And then the last week, we talked about how what we do today impacts our tomorrow. So the decisions that we're making financially right now are gonna impact us and the people that come after us to this church and in our families and in our community. So what we decide to do in terms of our money has a really long-term impact. So we're gonna finish out this series today. And if you missed those first three weeks, a big plug for going back and finding those. Um, you can watch them online. I'm a podcast person. I like to listen to stuff when I'm driving or doing chores or exercising. That You can always go back and catch a message if you've missed it. So if you miss one of these three, go back and grab those um, so you can hear about that. But today, we're gonna close out this series by spending time in Matthew chapter 25 and two main parts of that. So if you've got your Bible, you can kind of get ready for that or look it up on your phone. We'll have it on the screen here in a minute. But today we're gonna talk about the fact that God multiplies our generosity when we love others the way Jesus loves us. 
So when we take what we've been given, the love, the grace, the forgiveness that we've um, received from Jesus Christ and we're generous with it, God multiplies it. We're gonna look into scripture and find out about how that's true. Sometimes when we think about financial resources or money, we think in terms of addition and subtraction. And some of you are relieved because that's as far as our math knowledge goes. You know, we get to addition and subtraction. My kids are now in the third and sixth grades and they'll bring home this math homework and I'll be like, well, what do you think the answer is? <laughs> It's really important you figure it out. I don't wanna do it for you. You know, you won't learn anything. <laughs> We're just gonna start addition and subtraction to start with. So we think, okay, I go to work, I make money, and that adds to what I have, right? That's, that's part of the math there. But if you follow that logic, then we think, okay, if I give away money, then I have less. And a lot of people would nod their head if you said something like that. A lot of people um, would agree with you. So if we accept that view of money, then what we're saying is, if I give money away to God, then I'm gonna have less. And if we think that way, we probably don't do it. <laughs> it's, we don't want less. We don't want to have less, we want to have more. So if we think of our money that way, if we think that if I give it away, I'm gonna have less of it, then a lot of us just won't ever give it away. Or we think about it the other way. I don't have very much. So if I give what I'm able, which is not much, it doesn't make a difference. That's not gonna add up to anything. So I'll just wait and I'll just get to that one day. I'll give when I can. Jesus told a parable about this exact subject. A parable is just a story that Jesus tells in language that people can understand. Stories are helpful because they put it in a way we can get it because we need help with that a lot of times. And two, it's memorable. So Jesus would tell these stories so that we could remember what he was trying to teach them, what he's trying to teach us. So I told you that Jesus talks a lot about the kingdom of God and a lot about money. Bonus, in this parable, we get both. So that's exciting. We're gonna start in Matthew 25, verse 14. It starts out again, the kingdom of heaven. So it says again, because a lot of times Jesus was telling a parable, the kingdom of heaven is like, and he would compare it to something so that we can understand a little bit more about what it means. Again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by a story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. Then he left on his trip. The servant who received the five bags began to invest the money and he earned five more. The servant with the two bags also went to work and earned two more, but the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. After a long time, their master came back from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used his money. The servant to whom he'd given the five bags came forward and said, Master, you gave me five bags. I've earned five more. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I'll give you more responsibilities. Let's go celebrate. The servant who'd received two bags came forward and said, you gave me two to invest, I earned two more. The master again says, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful handling this small amount, so now I will give you more responsibility. Let's go celebrate. Then the one who had been given the one bag of silver came and said, master, I knew that you're a harsh man harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid to lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here's your money back. But the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant, if you knew that I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Then he ordered the man, take the money from this servant and give it to the one with the 10 bags of silver. To those who use well what they're given, even more will be given because they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what they have will be taken. Now throw this useless servant into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It took a real turn at the end there. Um, you know, it, it, if you're giving a speech to one of your uh, children who maybe didn't do what they're asked, here's a suggestion. No, I'm kidding, don't say that to them. <laughs> So this guy is in, has all this money and he's giving them bags of silver. This is not a little bit of money. This is a significant amount of money um, at that time that he's entrusting um, to these guys. And two of them find ways to invest the money and double what they had so that they give back to him more than what they had. The third one doesn't. He buries the money, he holds on to it so he doesn't lose it. 
And you may think, I get where he's coming from. Like, you hate to take a risk with somebody else's stuff. He knows this master has a temper. Smart of him to just make sure nothing bad happens. But the master is furious. He can't believe this guy wasted this awesome opportunity. Because what the guy did was he just sat still, stayed stagnant. He did nothing. But what about the beginning of the story? Because we understand that story, right? That it's good to like, you know, invest what you have and and that way you have more. Like that makes sense. But at the beginning, Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like this. You're like, wait a minute, what? (laughs) I forgot about that part because we went on to the other parts. Jesus said, the kingdom is heaven. The kingdom of heaven is like this. So that's the part that makes me think, how is the kingdom of heaven like this story? Well, let's assume that guy in charge going on the trip, let's assume that's God. And God gives each of us gifts. Maybe it's our health. Maybe it's our time. It's often our money. And God says, okay, here's what you have to work with. The stuff that's in your life. The influence that you have. The relationships you have. The money you have. This is your life. What are you going to do with it? And when we get to the end of our lives, we're going to give an account before God of what we've done while we've been here. Not so that we can earn love or forgiveness or any of those things. That all comes through the power of the empty tomb and Jesus' sacrifice, death, and resurrection. But we get this chance to say, I accepted Jesus and he changed my life. And then the fill in the blank is the part I'm talking about. After we became believers in Jesus Christ, or those of you that maybe haven't become a believer in Jesus Christ yet, how will we be able to describe our life at the end of it? I hope that what we're gonna say is God, you know, I wasn't perfect, you know that better than anybody, but I did what I could to follow Jesus and use my life to make an impact on other people. I was generous with my money. I used my house to welcome people. I shared my time with people in need. That would be a pretty great way to be able to end our life on this earth. But what if instead we're standing in front of God at the end of our lives and it's like, okay, how'd you, how'd you use what you were given? And I'm like, well, you know, I wasn't sure. I, I wasn't exactly sure what to do and I didn't wanna make a mistake. So I just, I just did nothing. I just buried it. I was afraid to say the wrong thing or I was afraid I might, you know, get canceled for some reason or I was afraid I might make a bobble and lose the investment. So I just buried it and I didn't do anything. What a waste that would be. What a sad end to life that would be to have to say, I didn't do anything. I I just kept it all for me. I just stood still. I was just not sure. So I just didn't do anything at all. And what's powerful about what Jesus just told is the part that comes next. Now, the problem with the way that we teach and do Sunday mornings or if you're listening to the podcast later, is that a lot of times here, we'll hear one chunk of scripture and we will talk through it, we'll teach on it, and we try to give as much context as we can. But then we wait a whole week before we hear the next part. Well, I wanna go ahead and let us hear the next part now. Because when Jesus was talking, he wouldn't have been like, come back next week and I'll tell you the rest. (laughs) He's, He's talking, right? He's still telling them what they need to know. I need us to hear what comes right after this parable. It's one of my favorite parts of scripture. Not because it's like, ooh, makes me feel so good. It's because it convicts me, it challenges me, it inspires me, it shapes a lot of the decisions that our family makes. It um, shapes the way that this church moves forward in the world. It's in Matthew 25, starting in verse 31. Here's what Jesus says right after the part where he's told the story about the way people have invested what's been given to them. He says, when the son of man returns in his glory and all the angels with him. So when Jesus comes back to earth, then he will sit upon his glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered in his presence. And he'll separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Now pause there. Goats, goats have come a long way in their PR. Goats used to be, when you hear about goats in the Bible, it's a negative thing. I know it's really positive now, but go with me. It's the other one where a goat is not as good as a sheep, okay? It's not greatest of all time. The shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He'll place the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom from the cre- that prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. 
And the righteous ones go, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink or a stranger and show you hospitality? Or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did to one of the least of these brothers and sisters, you're doing it to me. Then the king will turn to those on the left and say, Away with you, you cursed ones, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his demons. For I was hungry, and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty, and you didn't give me drink. I was a stranger, and you didn't invite me into your home. I was naked, and you didn't give me clothing. I was sick and in prison, and you didn't visit me. Then the Lord will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and not help you? And he will answer, I tell you the truth. When you refused to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you weren't willing to help me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And I have to wonder if when Jesus got to that part where he said, if you didn't do it to the people in most need, you didn't do it to me. I wonder if there's just a hush that falls over that crowd as people let that sink in and absorb what Jesus is saying. Because at the end of our lives, we already know the question on the final exam. It's like, did Jesus make a difference for you? I know you said that Jesus did, but did Jesus really change your life? And if so, what did you do? How did you use it? Did you try to love people the way Jesus loved you? Or did Jesus change your life and then it just stopped? And you were just glad and didn't tell anyone. When Jesus forgave you, were you willing to forgive other people? When you found sobriety, did you help somebody else find it? God has been generous to you. Have you been generous to anybody else? That, this right here, this scripture, this is why every week at Cokesbury Church, we talk about next steps. And if it's your first Sunday, come back. We'll talk about it again next week. Because Jesus is saying, Christianity, it's not a set of principles to ascribe to. It's not like an oath that you take. Like, I pledge that I believe these things. It's not just an intellectual pursuit. It's not something to cross-stitch on the wall and hang it up or put it on a bumper sticker or in your email signature. None of that stuff is going to change the world at all. Also, anyone can say that stuff, and it doesn't necessarily mean they believe it. You know how you find out if somebody believes the things that they do cross-stitch on the wall or put on the back of their car? It's how they live. I'm very aware that I have the Cokesbury C on the back of my car. It has saved me from doing the wrong thing many times. (laughs) I'm not saying every time. (laughs) But there is an accountability to the fact that we can say whatever we want to say. But the reason that it might actually make a difference is what we do. What do we do with the life that God has given us? Christianity, following Jesus, is about a way that we live. And if you are a follower of Jesus, and if you've followed him for any amount of time, then you start to learn that there's miracles that God's working every day. I'm one of them. I know the story of many of you all. Many of you are God's miracles. And there are things in our lives that just can't be explained apart from the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And you start to notice a different kind of math, one that they do not teach in school. It's a kind of God equation that happens the more and more you follow Jesus, and you notice it the more and more you follow him. For instance, you get to a point in your life where you can offer forgiveness to somebody else, but then you find that you're the one that receives this deep blessing and peace. That's God math. You gave forgiveness away, but you are the one that now has peace and joy in your own life. Same is true in our finances. When we give away money, some people think you'd have less, but what actually happens is we give away money and God multiplies that generosity. God will take whatever we can give and multiply it. The impact will be greater than what we could have imagined, both in the world and in our own lives and our own hearts. Our own needs are gonna keep getting met by God and by the people around us. When generosity occurs, that's when the Holy Spirit gets involved and it stops being subtraction. It turns into multiplication. God multiplies our generosity when we love other people the way he loves us. When our first child was born, I was totally blown away by how much love grew in our life, by how my own capacity to love grew, how the love in our marriage and in our home grew to this level that I didn't know was possible. And then we got pregnant with our second child and I was like, oh no. 
Because in my mind, I thought it's gonna be a subtraction. I'm going to have to subtract or divide some of my love for my first kid so that there's enough for the second one. And some of you are laughing because you had kids before I did and you already know what you tried to tell me, which is that instead of subtraction or division, it's multiplication. That somehow this other person comes into our family and there's not less, there's more. That's the kind of God math that I'm talking about. The, the fact that when we trust God with our very best gifts, Whatever those might be, God will multiply those gifts to bless us, to bless other people, to bless this world and this community. Now, what I'm not saying is that if you give away anything, time, money, whatever, that you're gonna become rich financially. There are people who will stand on stages like this all around our country today and they will say that. And I'll just be honest, I disagree. I don't think that's ever what Jesus has said to us. I think he's pretty clear that sometimes following him is gonna be really hard. And there will be Christians who have a lot of financial resources, but then there'll be others that don't. So I'm not saying that we're gonna be rich financially if we do this, but what I am saying is that if we follow Jesus like this and we're generous with everything that we have, we're gonna be rich in stuff that lasts, in stuff that cannot rust, in stuff that cannot be stolen, in stuff that you cannot buy insurance for because you don't need it because it can't ever go away. We're gonna be rich in the things that actually enrich our lives. Our generosity will be used by God so that there will be peace and joy in us and in the ones around us. There's this guy in the story and y'all, he's just standing still. He buried the good thing in his life and he did nothing with it. It didn't make any difference to anybody. And our faith, our story, the miracles in your lives, that's one of our choices. We can dig a hole in the ground and bury it and you know, stomp the dirt on it so that nobody else ever hears about it. And if we do that, it'll be safe. It'll be right there if we ever need it, but it's not gonna do anything. It's not gonna change anybody. If our faith is behind glass, if it's in a museum, if it's just something to be admired or something we you know, like to tell people about ourselves, like it's on our resume, like, oh, and also I'm a Christian in addition to having graduated from this place and having this job. If we treat it like that, then it's, it's nothing. God's economy is about multiplication. If we give of ourselves, really give of ourselves, it multiplies. It's a strange accounting system that when we give love, it multiplies. When we forgive, there's more forgiveness. When we're generous, God multiplies that generosity. Did you know that our church, along with other churches in this area, through the efforts of all the Christians at those churches, we were able at this church to send out 1,271 flood buckets to people in need in the communities affected by Hurricane Helene. In addition to that, I couldn't even, there's no way to calculate the amount of bottled water. I won't even try. We'd need something beyond multiplication. I don't know how much it was. Tons of health kits and hygiene kits also. That was a collected effort of a ton of Christians making sure that people had what they needed. But then on top of that, this one congregation, just Cokesbury Church family, has so far donated over $65,000 in one month that's going directly to those communities to help people in need. That's amazing. That's the way God multiplies, because my one gift is not gonna do a whole lot of difference. But when it goes with what everybody else is able to give, then it starts to get rolling, it starts to multiply. At an earlier service today, I reported that number as $60,000. Our finance office was like, that's an old number. And I was like, well, you gave it to me. And they said, now it's $65,000. That is what happened over the weekend since we had last talked about it. It's amazing to see how that multiplication occurs when God gets involved. We're gonna take a delivery to a place called Haywood Street tomorrow. Haywood Street is a ministry to people experiencing homelessness in downtown Asheville. Because of Haywood Street, Fig Tree exists. They have been mentoring us for over five years, teaching us how to do this work. They have let us come and visit. They have taken our panicked phone calls. They have helped us share resources. And now they're the ones in need. And they said, you know what we're gonna to try to do this week? Let's put on a little fall festival for the kids in town. Everything's upside down for them. They don't even have water that everybody can drink yet. Kids need to have some fun. So we're gonna try to do this Halloween event so that we just have a little normalcy and a little bit of joy in a really hard time. Many of them still aren't back in school. So they said, do you think you guys could just like deliver like pumpkins and candy bags? And that's what a lot of our student ministry has been working on this morning. And we're gonna take that tomorrow. That's not a big thing. That's not a lot to do, but it is the way God multiplies when love is shared. 
It's the way that God can take what we have, and when the Holy Spirit gets involved, the math gets wild, and the culture around us doesn't understand it because our culture says, hold on to it, store it up, hoard it, put it in big piles. Our culture tells us to go swimming in our vault like Scrooge McDuck in the DuckTales. That's the way our culture teaches us to be, and God says, no, 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 no. It's in the generosity. It's in the letting go. It's in the next steps. That's where the miracles are. That's where lives get changed. Jesus said something else that helps us here. It's in Matthew chapter 16, verse 25. Jesus said, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you'll save it. That's why we've spent this whole series talking about our money. Are we spending our whole life trying to just get more of it so that we have a bigger pile? For what? We can't take that with us. And if that's the journey that you're on, how's it going? Have you gotten to an amount where you now feel like it's enough? Because it seems to me like whatever that amount is that we think will be enough, the goalpost just keeps moving the closer we get to it. Because if we're looking for security and meaning in an amount of money in our bank account, it will never happen. It's elusive that we will just keep chasing at that our whole lives because Jesus tells us the kingdom of heaven is not defined by what we keep. It's defined by what we give away. Building God's kingdom on this earth means seeing the image of God in every person around us, the person who is hungry, the person who is hurting, the person who is lonely. And in the end, I guess it's not really our money that needs to change, it's our hearts. God is calling us to change our hearts, to understand that what we have and what we keep is not who we are, it's what we give away. So the question I want us to end this series with is, if, if today was the day that I was gonna stand in front of Jesus and the question gets asked, how did, how did you use it? How did you use what you were given? What answer would I give at this point in my life? Because that's of course the tricky thing about our lives. We have no idea how long it's gonna be. Hope it's very long for all of us. Hope we get to celebrate our 100th birthday with good health and happiness and our family around us. But the reality is that won't happen for every one of us. So the day that we stand in front of Jesus, what will be our answer? How did we use the stuff that we were given? How will you use the miraculous story of what God has done in your life? Are you gonna dig a hole and just hide it in there? Because, oh gosh, what if somebody finds out I'm not exactly the person they thought I was? I did that for a long time. I spent about a decade of my life acting that way, thinking, I don't wanna share like the whole thing, right? Like, ooh, that's that's a lot. And so a lot of my story, I just buried right in the hole and thought it'll just be there for me later if I need it. And then what I realized is the enemy is absolutely not scared of me at that point because I'm doing nothing to change this world. So eventually people in this room and other people in my life started to give me the courage and the confidence and the trust in God to say, get your hands dirty and dig that story back out and start to share it with the people around you. Because the story of what God is doing is too great to bury it. And the resources that we've been given, the money in our bank account is too important to just keep it for, for some time later, maybe. I'm not saying we don't save, I'm not saying we're not responsible, but how are we doing on our generosity? Are we as good at giving as we are at spending? I'm not. And it's in the giving that's gonna change the world. It's in the giving that's gonna change me. So what I wanna ask you today to think about is to reflect on this question. How am I using what's in my life? If I had to answer today, what did you do? Tell me about it. Tell me the story of how you used everything that you were given. Would there be a story of generosity to tell? We're never gonna do it perfectly, but we can take steps toward doing it faithfully. If you would stand up where you are. So we're gonna pray together in just a second. And after we do, when we sing, as always, if you wanna come up here and use this time and this space to pray, I wanna invite you to do that. Because there may be an area of your life you need to loosen up your grip a little bit and say, God, this is yours anyway. I need to give it back to you. Let's pray together. God, what we need is a change. We need you to change our hearts. We want you to change our lives. We want you to change this community. God, work in us. Help us to be generous. Help us to open up our time and our health and our finances and our faith to you so that 
It would actually make a difference in this world so that somebody else might come to know you. God, use us. We ask you to come into our lives and change our hearts today, God. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray and all God's people said, amen.